Hello, this is the second part of my video on Maslow's need hierarchy. In part one, I described the first four levels of the hierarchy concerned with physiological, safety, social belongingness, and esteem needs. Uh, we now reach the highest level, the peak of the pyramid, self-actualization, which Maslow saw as the realization of the individual's full potential. Maslow saw self-actualization as a quite different form of motivational need from the deficit needs discussed earlier, calling it a growth motivation related to being needs or be needs. Unlike the deficit needs, self-actualization did not involve balance or homeostasis. It continued to be felt after it was engaged and was likely to become stronger as we fed it. Thus, someone who had achieved self-actualization experienced a continuous desire to fulfill their potential, to be all that they could be. Unlike deficit needs, Maslow thought that this highest level of the hierarchy was only rarely attained. He once suggested by a mere 2% of the population. For most people, the everyday needs of physical survival and basic psychological satisfaction were so compelling that they never became self-actualizers. They were deprived. Separate from the basic hierarchy were distinctive cognitive and aesthetic needs, the needs for intellectual stimulation and for aesthetic harmony, which can be linked to self-actualization. Now let us turn to some general observations about the hierarchy as a whole. First, for Maslow, the needs in his hierarchy were developmental both in terms of the evolution of the human species, that is phylogenesis, so as it became easier to survive physically, the human species was more able to develop higher order needs, and secondly, in terms of the individual's development from birth onwards, that is ontogenesis, thus the baby's initial interests were centered on its immediate physical needs and it gradually developed higher level needs. Human culture played an important role here. It was an adaptive tool whereby human beings learned how to feed people more reliably and protect their basic safety, so that many people in modern societies had never experienced real hunger and went about their lives free from many of the dangers that had been everyday experiences for their ancestors. Thus, over time, self-actualization was achievable by more people, and indeed Maslow's concept of humanistic psychology was one which focused on the potential for furthering individual growth. How to assess this hierarchy of needs? Is it valid? Is it useful? My answer would depend on what we take the hierarchy to be. If we take it as an exact law-like statement of motivational priorities, then the evidence is both insufficient and contradictory. Briefly, sometimes the hierarchy applies, sometimes it doesn't. Both individuals and societies vary in the value they put on different needs, and the hierarchical succession is not invariable. Alternatively, if we take the hierarchy as a loose model of human motivations, then it becomes an illuminating diagnostic tool. Maslow himself was well aware that there were many individuals who had more complex motivational states than his basic hierarchy would suggest, and he was interested in the ways in which such exceptions could be understood. He also stressed that individual behaviors could be motivated by multiple needs. Eating, for example, might be motivated by psychological needs for comfort and companionship as well as by hunger. At the same time, he felt that his hierarchy generally held. It described a common pattern of motivational priorities that helped us to understand the human condition better. There might be many individual variations of the need hierarchy, reflecting the very different journeys through life that individuals experienced, but his model provided a point of reference against which these variations and distinctions could be analyzed and discussed. The hierarchy had scientific elements, but was more of a humanistic tool for understanding. For example, many individuals who had significant problems in their lives involving deprivation of particular needs tended to fixate on that set of needs for the rest of their life, the past deprivation still being salient even though they might now be fulfilled. That is, in the case of possible neurosis, 
the process of homeostasis did not work. Thus, those who had experienced extreme insecurity or hunger as a child might obsess over money and a well-stocked pantry, or hoard items such as shoes of which they had once been deprived. Or again, those who had experienced the loss of a family member through death or parental divorce might later be insanely jealous of their partner or harbor a pathological fear of abandonment. It was also possible for people to have become habituated to life without a particular need. Someone who had experienced lifelong hardship, such as chronic unemployment, for example, might have lost any aspirations for anything in life beyond bare survival. To use the term later developed by Martin Seligman, they lived a life of learned helplessness. While those who had been starved for love in their early life might become psychopathic, losing the ability to give or receive love. Again, it was possible for individuals to lose sight of the importance of those basic needs that they took for granted, as with the idealist who had forgotten the importance of basic survival needs and was then brought back to reality by some reversal of fortune, such as hunger or unemployment. In such circumstances, people could choose to become martyrs for their ideals, of course, but this was only likely if they had developed a strong, independent character and were prepared to risk material basics for the sake of what they believed. Maslow believed that it was also possible to gain insight into the individual's motivational needs and lacks by asking them what their goals for an ideal life and philosophy of the future were. In conclusion, my view is that this humanistic interpretation is a sufficient basis for using the hierarchy. If it helps us to understand human behaviors and motivations better, then it is of continuing value. Indeed, its widespread use, even 70 years after it was first introduced, suggests that many people still find it insightful. A final point. Like any hypothesis or theory in psychology, Maslow's need hierarchy has to be seen in the context of its time, so that, quite obviously, part of what Maslow was doing in his original paper was to map out an alternative framework of behavior to the then-dominant behaviorist paradigm. Again, he was insistent that the motivational needs which he outlined related to individual goals rather than to drives, and that behaviors were commonly determined by multiple factors, and as such not reducible to a single causal trait. People might eat or have sex or be aggressive for a variety of reasons. Thank you for listening. I will add other related videos later.